Father God, would you prepare all of our hearts this morning to receive your word? May your words edify, convict, strengthen, and pierce us in a way that causes us to delight in you more and love our fellow brothers and sisters in this church and across the globe with more affection. Father, may your word run this morning, not only in this church, but in our city and in all the places that your word is being preached. May you guard my mouth against things that are unhelpful, and may you receive all the glory from Missoula to Mozambique. It's in Jesus' precious and awesome name that I pray. Amen. Well, if you had to guess the top three mission-sending countries in the world, what would be your guesses? I'm sure most of you would affirm that the United States would be in the top three, but what about the others? What if I told you that the race was much closer than you might think? Today, one of the largest exporters of the gospel is also the only Asian country with over 20% of its population identifying as Christians. Robert J. Thomas was a Welsh Protestant missionary to China in the 1800s. And shortly after landing in China, he was reassigned to a different post, which happened to be one of the closest ports to the Korean Peninsula. In God's providence, Robert would meet a Korean refugee, and he became obsessed with the Korean language, and more importantly, with the Korean people. After learning the Korean language, he agreed to become an interpreter for the French Navy as they set out on a mission to go save some Jesuit priests who were stuck in Korea. And when they arrived at the Korean River port, they were attacked immediately, and Robert abandoned ship with his arms full of Bibles. He made it to the river shore and began scattering the last of his Bibles, And before he died, Robert prayed for the soldier that had his sword pointed at him, gave him the Bible, and then he was stabbed to death and burned there on the river bank. This young Korean soldier took the Bible home, and after reading and studying it, it, he is said to have been converted and became a devout believer and an elder at Anju Episcopal Church in South Korea. Many in the crowds on the riverbank picked up the Bibles that Robert had scattered and became believers as well. Korea would slowly be converted, and now over 100 years later, South Korea has the largest Asian Christian percentage in the entire world. Flocks of faithful brothers and sisters would follow Robert to the shores of Korea and spill their blood. But Korea has now become a powerhouse for gospel proclamation to the ends of the earth. Some might look at Robert J. Thomas's death and say, what a waste. I'm sure there were some in the French Navy who pitied Robert as they saw him die on that shore for some books or for some silly message. But those of us who have been washed by the Holy Spirit and have been given this same gospel message know that Robert isn't to be pitied. And that book that he died for isn't to be pitied. And the message that he died giving away wasn't for nothing. For in the words of Paul, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And most of you have never heard the name or the story of Robert J. Thomas. And that is just okay. He could care less if you knew his name. He didn't go to the shores of Korea for you to know his name. He went to the shores to proclaim the name of Jesus. This small and insignificant death in the scope of history was the means by which the people of Korea would come to know the Savior of the world. And this morning, we are finishing the account of Stephen and his death. He too died an insignificant death in the scope of history. But Stephen's death and the king he proclaimed would become the means by which the gospel would begin to spread from the small area of Jerusalem in the Middle East to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so as we examine the last minutes of Stephen's life and his death, we are going to see, by God's grace, the peace in death and the purpose of persecution 
the peace in death and the purpose of persecution. And we're gonna investigate this with two simple questions. We're gonna ask the text two different questions. First, in verses 54 through one, the first part of verse one, we're gonna ask the question, how could Stephen have peace in death? And then in verses, the second half of verse one through four, we're gonna ask the question, what is the purpose of persecution? And I know some of you are sitting here asking the question, what does this story about the first Christian martyr have to do with me? How could this apply to my life here and now? And though most of us will never find ourselves in the same situation as Stephen, all of us will eventually feel the pressure of believing what you believe. I know of one dear sister in this church that has already lost friends because of her new faith in Jesus. It could also look like you losing your job for holding certain biblical convictions. College students, we're so glad that you're here and welcome. It's becoming harder and harder for biblical Christianity in today's day and age for you on campus. And so I need you to know that you might face some of the harshest pressure to hold fast to Jesus in this day and age. Yet in this passage we are looking at this morning, we see that Stephen's convictions and his steadfast faith in Jesus led to his eventual death. So a question we can look to this passage to answer for us is this. If Jesus was able to satisfy Stephen even unto death, can this same Jesus satisfy us in our persecutions and pressures and trials as well? Let's start by backing up a little bit to verse 51 to give us a little context like Devin was saying at the end of Stephen's speech, and I'm going to read through verse 55, and we're going to see that Stephen had peace in death because first he saw that Jesus as his true joy. So starting in verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now Luke's accounting of this event is truly good reporting. If you weren't with us last week, like Devin mentioned, and are just reading just this section of Acts, you would honestly think that the they in verse 54 was referring to an angry mob of common people. But the they that Luke is referring to here are the men of the Sanhedrin. These were the religious leaders of the day, the holy men that were staunch protectors of the law. Yet Luke's recounting of these uh, men's reaction to Stephen's speech is one that you would expect at a brawl of the wild game, when some fans have had too much to drink and their tongues have become a little too loose. A visceral anger had overtaken these religious leaders to the point that they were literally grinding their teeth at him. Just imagine that sight and those sounds. And Stephen has now become a lamb in the middle of a circle of circling lions. But Stephen is given a vision and gazes into heaven and sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 55 says that he's full of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit, mind you, that Stephen says in verse 51 that they are resisting and rejecting. Now, we don't do a ton of screen time in our home, but when we do, there's a consistent pattern of not being able to draw our children's attention from the TV screen. I could literally tell them that I'm going to take their favorite stuffy away for their entire life, and they wouldn't blink an eye. They would just continue to look at the TV. I'm sure I'm not the only parent or babysitter in this room who has experienced this amazing phenomenon. Stephen is literally looking at an angry and furious mob in front of him, yet the vision of Jesus superseded any fear he might have had. Nothing could avert or remove his eyes from the resurrected Jesus on his throne. He is transfixed on Jesus. We live in a world that vies for our attention at every turn. 
I remember living in Hollywood, California, and the number of billboards and advertisements that I passed from my apartment to my hospital never ceased to amaze me. All of them had some kind of scandalous or provocative image on it. Now, we might not live in Hollywood, but we have plenty of distractions ourselves. Sports, NFL, our phones, streaming services. We, may, we might not be surrounded by prowling lions like Stephen, but make no mistake, we are surrounded by spiritual darkness everywhere. Are our eyes so firmly fixed on Jesus that no amount of persecution or pressure or threat can remove our eyes from Jesus? Do we know the Savior of our lives in a way that we will not be distracted by every whim or breeze? This has been extremely convicting for me. In what ways am I purposefully redirecting my gaze from Jesus? Praise God for giving us Stephen, who shows us not only what it means to gaze at Jesus, but also shows, it, shows us what it means to confess Jesus as well. Look at verses 55 through 57 again with me, and we'll see Stephen's confession. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Now, it's really easy to read these verses quickly, but I want to stop and highlight two things that Stephen says that are very, very purposeful. First, if you look at verse 55, it's clear that Jesus is the center of his vision. But... Look at what Stephen calls Jesus in verse 56. He says, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man. Now, not too long ago, Tyler preached on Luke 22 when Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin. And mind you that this is also the same Sanhedrin that Stephen is now standing in front of in our text. Luke 22, uh, starting in verse 66, says this, And they led him, that is Jesus, away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. You see, Jesus equated his messianic title of the son of man also with the son of God, and they crucify him for it. They take Jesus from this meeting at the Sanhedrin to Pilate and to Herod, and then they crucify him. Fast forward to our text this morning, and we see that not only has Stephen accused the Jews of killing the Messiah, Stephen has now confirmed what Jesus pronounced of himself in Luke 22. The last time the word son of man were heard in this room was from the very mouth that they were about to crucify. Stephen is showing that Jesus's words were always true. And this brings us to the second important phrase of note. Look closely at verse 56. Did you notice that Stephen proclaims that Jesus is standing? This is opposite of what we just read in Luke 22, where Jesus describes himself as sitting. But this is just ripe with hope and comfort. You have Jesus standing to receive and comfort the about to be first martyr of the Christian faith. What peace must have rushed over Stephen in this moment? Stephen would still be killed in just a few moments, and this wouldn't change the outcome. So why is this important? I think the world would say, if your Jesus was as powerful as you say he is, why couldn't he just save Stephen right then and there? Remove him from the stoning. This isn't a bad question. I'd say that this is actually a quality question for the world to ask. And maybe some of you are even asking yourselves this question. But what if I proposed a different question? What if I asked instead, do I value Jesus or do I value my comfort or safety more? You see, as Stephen stood there, 
moments from death, he got what he had been longing for since Jesus' ascension. He got all of Jesus. He might not have understood why his about to be death was part of the plan, but what he did understand was that his Jesus was worth it. Whatever the plan was, Whatever may come, Stephen had peace because Jesus was worth all of it. To circle back to Stephen's confession of the Christ, it's clear that Stephen couldn't help but proclaim what he knew to be true. He wasn't under any illusions when he confessed to the crowd his vision that it would lead to his eventual stoning. Yet, he still confessed. We have a dear sister in this church that can't help but recommend food or household products to us. We never have to encounter a problem or a a new gluten-free product because this dear sister has already done the research, tried it, and is now trying to sell us on it. Now, this naturally comes out of a loving heart that can't contain the joy she desires for us. And so, too, is Stephen's delight in Jesus. Jesus is manifested in his proclamation of Jesus on the throne. His confession is immediate because his delight is overwhelming. Just as he couldn't tear his eyes away from Jesus, he can't help but confess the truth and his joy. Now, this is juxtaposed with the immediate reactions of the men around him. Look at verses 57 and 58. But they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now we talk a lot about salvation and about conversion at Sovereign Hope. And if you're new or you're visiting us for the first time and these words are new to you and you're a little confused, that's okay. Stick with us. For this is why the scriptures are so helpful. For in verse 56, you see Stephen's heart a heart that has been converted, stone to flesh. Paul describes a converted heart in Titus 3 as a washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit that is poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. Now, Stephen's actions are one of a heart that has been washed by the Holy Spirit. Yet, the men described in 57 and 58 are described as men that stop their ears, yell loudly, and take Stephen outside the city like a lynching mob. And their hearts were as hard as the stones that they were casting at Stephen. Stephen's converted heart's natural response was one of confession and of delight. The mob's unconverted heart's natural response was one of defiance and of murder. As I continued to study this text and meditated on it more and more, a question that came coming to me was, how can I know that I would die with sheer peace and delight like Stephen? You see, Stephen's life is really summed up in a couple of verses in Acts. 95% of Stephen's spotlight in Acts is in his speech. You get some of his life as he is selected as a deacon of the church. And then you have these couple of verses that describe his death. But it only takes a couple of verses to realize that Stephen's moments that are recorded before his eventual death are just the natural climax of a life of faithfulness and obedience. Stephen is described as a man full of faith and of power and of grace. He is said on several occasions to be full of the Holy Spirit. And when we we return to the book of Acts later in the fall, we are going to get to the main character besides God himself, we're going to get to Paul. Many people look at Paul and they think they could never emulate him. It's true that Paul was specially gifted to be the Paul, the great apostle. But more often than not, Luke in the book of Acts gives us little portraits of men and women that are ordinary men and women who demonstrate a life of faithfulness and obedience. Stephen was an ordinary believer that God chose to use as the church's first martyr. Therefore, we need not worry about how we will die. We should be first concerned with how we will live. And the Bible tells us to love God with all our soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we do that day after day, week after week, God will use it 
So let us live a life of faithfulness and obedience and let God choose how he uses it and how he chooses to end it. The scriptures also tell us that Stephen was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, which should be the marks of every believer, not just Stephen. For look with me quickly at Romans 8, starting in verse 9. Paul writes, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been given a new heart in Jesus, then you are full of of the Holy Spirit. Is this how people describe you? When they think of you, do they see a man or a woman who is full of faith and of power and of the Holy Spirit? When our kids describe us, do they see mommies and daddies that are full of faith, full of grace, and full of the Holy Spirit? Or are we satisfied with simply being labeled as beautiful or as successful? And to be clear, I am not saying that we should desire or seek to be martyred for the faith, but I am exhorting all of us to live lives of faithfulness, grace, and full of the Holy Spirit, lives that delight in Jesus both in life and in death. The last way that Stephen is able to have joy in his death is because he saw Jesus as his only hope. Let's look at verses 59 through 60. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In this section, Stephen prays to Jesus twice. So let's look at the first one a little closer. Stephen cries out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And if this sounds familiar, you're not mistaken. In Luke 23, before Jesus dies, he cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In some of Stephen's final words, he invokes the very words of the one he is crying out to. How beautiful is this? Even more beautiful are the words he uses. Notice that he doesn't say, please, would you receive my spirit? Or let my final sacrifice and death be enough for you to receive my spirit. He says, Jesus, receive my spirit. It is a declaration. Over the past several years, some of us have befriended some of the Afghan refugees here in Missoula. And as we've gotten to know them better and learned more and more about Islam, something has really stood out to me. The life of a Muslim is guided by the life of the great prophet Muhammad. They believe if they follow strict practices and live a life that is guided by the principles set out by Muhammad, that they would have a chance at getting into paradise. There are no guarantees, though, into paradise. Just a never-ending weight scale that you hope you have tipped enough to get you in. Even Muhammad himself, the great prophet, was not a shoe-in to paradise. Even him. If Stephen was a Muslim... It would make sense for him to beg or ask Jesus to let him in. But that is not what Stephen says. He says with certainty, Jesus, receive my spirit. When we have placed our trust in Jesus and when he has given us a new heart, there is no question to our salvation. Paul says that the Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation. Therefore, we can cry out with Stephen on that final day because he is our only hope. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And so if you're sitting here this morning, you've been trying to work for your salvation, or you've always thought that the Christian life is one of self-betterment, I'm here to tell you that you've been sold a lie. For there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. No amount of good works or short-term mission trips or church attendance can save you. Only Jesus can. So call out to him in faith. 
If you're scared of the road that this will lead you on, or if you're scared what your family or friends might say, come talk to me, or come talk to the people sitting around you. Don't leave here today with questions. We might not have every single answer, but we can point you to the God who does. Now, Stephen doesn't just stop there, though. He prays a second time and calls out as he is being peppered with stones, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And again, if this sounds familiar, you're not wrong. Jesus, as he's being placed on the cross, he yells out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even as the author of life is being put to death, Jesus prays that those around him would be saved. And we see the fruit of this prayer as one of the thieves being crucified with him repents and he believes. Now Stephen too prays for those around him to be forgiven through faith and repentance. He knows that Jesus is the only way for those that are sentencing him to death. Therefore, he cries out to him in prayer to save and forgive these men. He invokes the words of his Jesus. Again, it's said that if you were to cut John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, that scripture would just bleed out of him. I think the first person to own that compliment would be Stephen, though. In the midst of fear and death, he breathes, sweats, and bleeds Jesus. May that be said of us one day. May that be said of the saints here at Sovereign Hope. And though it's not immediate, fruit of Stephen's prayer would quickly follow. In verses 58 and the first half of verse 1 say this, And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, and Saul approved of his execution. Luke is giving us a sneak peek into the next section of Acts and the great conversion of Saul to Paul. For starting in chapter 8 of Acts, we see the miraculous conversion of Saul and the fruit of Stephen's prayer. Everyone knows Paul the Apostle, and rightfully so. But what about the man who prayed a dying prayer to a resurrected Savior that set in motion the gospel going forth to the ends of the earth? I'm sure the apostles thought that they would get decades of faithful service out of Stephen after selecting him as one of the deacons of the early church. And this was probably not in their plan when they laid hands on him and prayed. But I don't believe that Stephen or the apostles would change anything about what played out in God's sovereignty. This small and insignificant death of a lowly deacon that was part of a new faction of Jews following a supposedly dead Messiah was the domino that would start the spread of the gospel out of Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, may we not see small acts of faithfulness and obedience in service of the king as petty and is useless. God uses it all. It's all for his glory and our good. And so let us rest in this truth. And one last thing to point out before we move on from Stephen's death is Luke's insertion of Stephen taking his last breath. He says, Stephen fell asleep. Now, it's an interesting choice of words, but it's not uncommon in the New Testament. Jesus, when speaking of Lazarus's death, says that he has fallen asleep. And this is also used several times by Paul in his letters to describe believers that have died. So why describe it this way? As we move through the book of Acts after our break in the Song of Solomon, I want you to notice how many times the resurrection of Jesus and the eventual resurrection of the believers is mentioned in many of the speeches that are recorded in Acts. We often talk about Jesus' death on the cross, and rightfully so. But the resurrection was a big deal to the early church, and again, rightfully so. When most of us think about our deaths, we think it'll happen in some sort of peaceful way, 20 or 30 years after our retirement. Yet, we just read the account of Stephen's death, and it's widely believed that besides John, all of the other apostles were martyred for their faith. A Stephen-like death was the expected norm, not the exception. Yet Luke, in recording Stephen's death, shows the peace in which Stephen died. He cries out to Jesus, and then he falls asleep. 
He falls asleep because the bones that were crushed that day by a lynching mob will not stay buried and crushed. One day his body will be awakened and renewed on that last day. Timothy Rogers writing on Stephen's death says it this way, for Stephen's death, for my Lord has been there before and has perfumed and sanctified the grave. O oh, grave, you look with a dreadful aspect to flesh and blood, but not so to faith. And I bid you welcome as the way to glory. Dear brothers and sisters, let us heed these last moments from Stephen. For we who have placed our faith in Jesus, in his substitutionary death on the cross, who have been wiped clean by his blood, we need not fear death. We can have peace for death has lost its sting. Instead, when the time comes, may we bid death welcome, for it is the way to glory. Let us have peace in death as we are united with Jesus, our King. Now, after Stephen's death, the heat gets turned up. And one of my favorite chapters in The Hobbit is entitled, Out of the Frying Pan and Into the Fire. And I think that's a perfect summation for this section of Acts. Since the healing of the lame man in front of the temple, the heat on the early church was growing and growing. They First, they were imprisoned, and then they were threatened, then they were beaten, and now they are killed. So if you remember Daniel's sermon a couple weeks ago in Acts 5, Gamaliel gave a warning to the Sanhedrin. He told them to be careful with these apostles, for if this movement was from man, it would fail. But if it was from God, they would not be able to squash it, and they might even be found opposing God himself. And so we now come to a transition point in the book of Acts. What will happen to the early church under severe persecution? Would the church fail, or would it thrive? And if it thrives, a natural question, and our second main point that comes from this text is, what is the purpose of persecution? Let's read the second half of verse one, and we're going to see the first purpose of persecution. It reveals our hearts. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. If you recall from the very first sermon in the book of Acts, Tyler pointed out that the verse, uh, verse sorry, verse eight in chapter one was not only a roadmap to the book of Acts, but is also a thesis of the book. The last thing that Jesus says to the apostles before ascending into heaven is this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now scripture is so cool. If you're new to the Bible or if the book of Acts is brand new to you, what a treat I hope this is for you. Even if you've been reading the Bible now for 60 plus years, I hope this continues to be a delight. We have the pleasure of reading God's word in hindsight, and now we get these aha moments. If you were a believer in Jerusalem during this time, a lot of this wouldn't make sense. You would be scared, frightened, and confused. Your Messiah had come, then he died. Then he came back to life, then he left again into heaven. And then he promised that you would receive the Holy Spirit, which happened in Acts 2. And now we're supposed to be going in power to be witnesses of all, all of Jesus has said and taught. And so why are we now being thrown into jail, threatened, and stoned? Isn't this counterintuitive? Up until this point in Jewish history, everything has centered around Jerusalem and the temple and the Holy Land. Yet Stephen, in his speech that we saw last week, emphasized that it's never been about a place or a temple or a piece of land. God has sustained his people outside of the promised land and in captivity. The spirit of God doesn't dwell in a man-made temple. He now lives in the bodies of believers the good news of God's salvation was never meant to just stay in Jerusalem with the Jewish people. God has made it clear from the very beginning in Genesis, through the prophets and through Jesus, that the gospel was never meant to be for one nation. Israel was the nation that God meant to use to bless all other nations. 
Now, Psalm 67, which my wife read earlier, says this, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. God's saving power was meant to be known on all the earth, among all the nations. All the peoples are to praise God. Therefore, this scattering due to the persecution was all part of God's plan. It wasn't an accident or a mistake. It was fulfilling everything that Jesus had said. Now, as we move into verses two through three, we're going to see that Luke presents to us a great case study into the hearts of men. Let's start in verse two. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering the house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. On the one side, you have devout men that buried Stephen and lamented over him. Luke doesn't specify who these men are, but we can deduce that these are men that they risked a lot to honor and to bury him. They not only touch a dead body of a man accused of blasphemy, which was a no-no under the old law, but they are inherently associating themselves with Stephen. And then this is juxtaposed with the description of Saul ravaging the church. Paul, who is Saul, later records in a speech in Acts 22 that he not only sent people to prison, but he also killed them. Brian Vickers points out that it is important not to conceive of Paul as faithful according to the old covenant. Before his conversion, Paul was not a faithful Jew. One cannot be faithful while rejecting the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Now, I highlight this in order to point out that Saul, up to this point, would be considered a faithful Jew, albeit a radical faithful Jew. He would have been considered doing the job of rooting out blasphemy and protecting the name of God. But in actuality, persecution was revealing the true nature of Saul's heart. Saul was still blind to the truth. He was persecuting and killing those who had their eyes open to Jesus being the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Persecution, however, in the case of the devout men revealed eyes that had been opened and hearts that had been changed. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, once said, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others In their sins. Saul was the Jew of Jews. He was a man of God. But this Jewish man of God looked far from the example of truly godly and devout men who had hearts of flesh. Saul was a dead corpse with some lipstick on him. He walked the walk and talked the talk, but in the end, he was dead inside, and his actions looked just like the Roman Empire his people despised the most. The Romans took what wasn't theirs and squashed anything that didn't conform. And ironically, Saul and the Jewish leaders were doing the exact same to the early church because it didn't conform to their vision of what God's promise to his people should look like. The Roman, um, if you're sitting here this morning and you've never been able to shake the same sin that has been plaguing you for years or for decades if you're wondering why your every decision leads to sin and destruction, if you're sitting here thinking that there's no way God could forgive me for what I have done, then take heart, dear friend. For the gospel is the power to save all, not to just the kind of bad ones. Jesus saves all who would come to him. Now, Saul, who later becomes Paul, as we'll see in a couple months, writing to Timothy, describes his conversion like this. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason that in me, As the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. 
Now, persecution, murder, and blasphemy led to revealing the true nature of Paul's heart. He was dead, dead in his sins and trespasses, as I once was, as many of you once were. But God in his great mercy has chosen to redeem those who would put their trust not in their works, but in the finished work on the cross of Jesus. So come to him, dear friends. Come to the one who sees all, who knows all, and who redeems all. And this leads us to the last purpose for persecution. It reveals God's plan and his power. Let's read verse four together. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. In verse one, we saw that the church began to scatter to the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then verse four begins to tell us what they did once they were scattered. They preached the word. And we knew what they were fleeing from. Jews like Saul were taking Christians out of their homes, killing some and throwing others into prison. And it would have been a natural response to go hide in some caves or to lay low until the heat turned down. Yet verse four tells us that they preached the word. Persecution has led to the spread of the gospel. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit China, the Chinese government, government used this as leverage to kick out all foreign missionaries out of the country. Many who had labored in China for decades haven't been able to return to this very day. But we are already seeing the fruit of these restrictions. Many of these missionaries that haven't been able to return have now put down roots in other Asian and Southeast Asian countries. The underground church in China had been poured into for so long that they are now thriving on their own with little help from outside missionaries. And now the missionaries that were kicked out are evangelizing in strengthening churches in the surrounding area. You see, the intense persecutions and restrictions has led to an unintended consequence the enemy did not foresee, both in China and in the region. The gospel is going forth. New people groups are being reached. Churches and believers are being strengthened. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. He will build his church and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And as I continue to reflect on this passage and the question of what is the purpose of persecution, I simply came away amazed each time. God and his infinite wisdom and sovereignty chose to and continues to choose persecution as his vessel of spreading the gospel through the world. Brian Vickers commenting on this section of Acts says it beautifully. He says, Paul highlights the unexpected nature of God's way of carrying out his plan for the world. From choosing an idol worshiper in Ur for the fulfillment of his ultimate promises, and an Egyptian educated man in Pharaoh's court to save Israel from slavery, to raising up imperfect judges who keep the nation afloat during a horrible era of apostasy and suffering, and a boy who kills a giant with a slingshot and becomes king, and not to mention Jesus coming as a carpenter from Nazareth who tells people the greatest thing that they can become is a servant and who dies cursed on a cross. No one but God would write this script. This is God's story, not ours. And this is God's church, not ours. Therefore, let us trust in the God who calls the shots and is building his church in ways that are beyond our wildest imaginations. When we are in the midst of suffering, pain, or even persecution, it is so hard to see past the fog of war. We're confused, and we're lost, and we feel like God isn't there. I'm sure that many of the believers in the early church felt this way after Stephen's death. Yet it was all part of God's sovereign plan. Jesus said that the gospel would go forth from Jerusalem, then to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And now it's becoming clear that the means by which God has chosen to do this, his plan in all of this is through persecution. We may not always understand in the moment why God is choosing to do things in our lives and in the world, but God's plan is not dependent on our understanding. So kids and teenagers, I want you to listen to this. There's going to come times in your life when your parents tell you something and you don't understand why it's happening. 
You're going to be confused and unable to imagine a life without someone in your life. And that's okay. The Bible is full of stories of men and women who don't understand what's going on or why something is happening to them. But this is not when you throw your faith away. This is when you drive your stake deeper and you cling to God and his word. It's in these uncertain times that we cling to our certain God. We can only see one foot in front of our faces. But we trust the God who created the world and everything in it, and who can not only see the short game, but also the eternal one. A Chinese pastor who trains other underground and unregistered church uh, plants once said this, sometimes we feel like God is pretty close to these things. Sometimes we feel like God is pretty far, but we know that everything is under his control and he is behind everything. Whatever happens is God's way to prepare his church. He is always preparing his church. So dear church, when we don't understand what's going on in our lives or in the life of our church sometimes, let us trust in the God who does. He was preparing the early church to begin to take the gospel out of Jerusalem. He was preparing the Chinese church to thrive and grow under immense persecution during the COVID pandemic. And he is preparing us. May we be a church that remains certain and faithful to our God in times of uncertainty. Which brings me to our last point of application for this section in Acts. Though we may never reach this kind of persecution that we see here in Acts or what is experienced every day in China or Afghanistan, that doesn't mean it shouldn't shape the way we pray for the persecuted church throughout the world. Would we love for there to be religious freedom in every single country in the world and for our missionaries to not have to fight for visas or to stay in the countries that they are ministering in? Yes, of course, that would be ideal. But we also live in a country today that has religious freedoms and the church is declining. Or, more accurately, it's refining. Religious freedom does not equal conversions and church growth. America is proof of this. What we see around the world are examples of Christians who have left mother and father and sister and brother for the sake of Jesus. We see those that have counted the cost of following the Savior of the world We see a church that no matter how hard it tries to be snuffed out, it pops back up stronger. We see believers who truly believe that any sacrifice made on behalf of the one who has snatched them from the fires of hell is worth every second of temporal suffering. For they have been bought by the one who will give them eternal life with him. So dear church, let us pray for our brothers and sisters around the world differently today. May we pray for them to endure the sufferings of this present age, for they are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. Let us pray that they do not lose heart, for this light momentary affliction is preparing an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Let us pray with Paul, who was a persecuted missionary, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and run and be honored and that they may be delivered from the wicked and evil men. But most of all, may we pray that they would know and believe that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things to come, nor things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So I'd like to lead us in a prayer now not only for our church and our hearts, but for the persecuted church around the world. Would you please pray with me? Father God, your word is so good. Father, what a delight it is to mine the depths of scripture each and every week with this body of believers that you have so graciously brought together in your church. As we looked at the martyrdom of Stephen and at your persecuted church this morning, We can't help but pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. These brothers and sisters have counted the cost of following you, but know that because of what you have bought them from, they can't turn back. Where else would they go? 
You are the source of life. So, Father, we pray for the persecuted church that oftentimes finds themselves as refugees or driven from their homes. They are no longer welcome because of you and their love for your son, Jesus. We pray that their hearts would not grow faint, that your spirit would breathe hope into these brothers and sisters as they suffer for the sake of the name. Father, would you strengthen these churches as they are driven underground, that they, as the scattered believers that we saw in Acts 8 did, would preach the gospel wherever they go. And Father, would you give us, Sovereign Hope Church, the resiliency and reliance on you as pressure grows in our country to firmly believe what your word says. Father, we need you. We need your strength to press on and to boldly preach the gospel. Would you give us and our persecuted brothers and sisters the strength? For we know that your church will prevail and that your name will be great from the rising of the sun to its setting. We pray all this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.